Welcome to our worship service online. Thank you for setting aside this time to connect with us and share the worship experience with each other. Wherever you are, at home watching or out there on the street protesting, I want to encourage you to use every opportunity to express the compassion and support for those that are hurting through our words and our actions and unite our prayers that the protest will lead to a real change and progress. We are looking forward to resuming our services in person Sabbath, July the 4th. We are now in the preparation process and will communicate the details, detailed expectations with you soon. Those of you in vulnerable category are strongly advised to stay connected with us from your homes. Hopefully the time for all of us to join for in-person worship and fellowship will come soon. For now, please continue to watch us online, online, join the Bible study groups on Zoom, consider sharing your burdens and spending some time in prayer with others on a Zoom prayer session on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. The links are on our website, and also you'll find uh, more information under this page. Later on, we will honor our graduates, but now we wish a happy birthday to Brett McDougall. Hi, Brett. Julia Wilson, celebrating her birthday today. Happy birthday, Julia. Mason Favreau, Corbin Ruley, Jeffrey Roach, I hope you're doing well. James Butler, say hi to Renee. <laughs> David Cash, Elizabeth Castilla, Audrey Hunt, Cornell Cretoro. Happy birthdays to you. And a happy anniversary to Ed and Lisa Rader, Norm and Alice Farley, and Gary and Donna Lee Strunk. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Our opening hymn for church today is number 181, Does Jesus Care? We will sing verses one and three. Please join me. Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for me? As the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long. Oh yes, he cares, I know he cares, his heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dream. church family, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you for the blessings. Thank you for the safety and security that you provide. As we worship today, we just pray that your word comes vividly through uh, Pastor Elijah and Pastor Cliff and Pastor Jonathan. We're so lucky to have such great pastors, such a great church. And we just look forward to the day that our whole family of church can get together. Name. Amen. 
Happy Sabbath, church family. It's that time to call for the offering again. I just want to say how much we as a church staff are so grateful for you. You've been so generous and so consistent in your giving. You know, this past week is, with all the unrest that's happening, people were sharing stories. And one particular story that was shared was shared by one of my former young people. Actually, I had the privilege of dedicating his child a few years back. And he shared what it was like to live in this community, not necessarily the Ukaipa, but the Inland Empire as a young black, black man. And he related of the challenges and the, the burden that he had to face and the, the, the profiling that he had to experience that um, other people that didn't have black skin didn't have to experience. And it was extremely sad. And he, he talked about how heavy that burden was. But he said, you know, the one thing that, 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 that makes that burden lighter is if other people are in there carrying the weight and carrying that big boulder, it makes that boulder lighter. And when we empathize with him, we listen to him and, and did what we could to, to instill d different set of values in the next generation, it helped make that burden lighter. As he told that story, I'm reminded of how if one person has to carry the financial load of the church, it's impossible and too heavy. But if we all do our part, even little parts, it makes that burden that much lighter. And that's exactly what this church has done. And we are absolutely grateful for you each and every day for that. And so thank you for making this burden light. And we will meet again in person, church, very, very, very soon. In the meantime, thank you for your consistent generosity. Remember, just click on the donate link below. Or if you live in the Inland Empire and you run out of tithe envelopes or would like for one of the pastors to pick it up, please call our church secretary and we'll be more than happy to arrange for that. But right now, let's go ahead and give God thanks and pray. Father God, we are grateful for the generosity of our saints. We thank you for how you bless the Ukaipa Seventh-day Adventist Church. Father, I pray you'll continue to multiply the monies and the gifts that are given so we can continue your work and hasten the soon return. And God, as we look forward to your soon return, we also look forward to gathering together as a church family soon. Be with everyone. And be with these gifts especially is my prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
boys and girls, this is Miss Jennifer and I have Miss Kirsten here and we're going to be telling you the children's story today. Before we get to the children's story, remember to collect the children's offering and bring it to church when we see each other once again. Today's children's story is about how we can be stronger together. And I have a lot of books here and I need Kirsten to put take the books for me. So we well, they're a lot, they're pretty heavy, so here you go. Can you get it by yourself? Yeah, okay. Boys and girls, do you have a lot of books like this? Are you strong? Can you help with books? So, Kirsten, I need you to put them right there. Is it okay? You got it? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Okay. They're very... Okay. Good job, Kirsten. Thank you for helping me. This is something like following Jesus. It may feel easy at first, but over time, it can feel very heavy. The world we live in, plus our hearts, that can be selfish, is like a constant force, making it hard to follow God's plan. God gave us a wonderful gift. Can you guess what it is, boys and girls? It's a group of friends who are all working together to learn how to love God and how to love each other. Hmm, who do you think it is? It's called our church family. Let's do our strong test again. Instead of Kirsten doing it alone, I'm going to help her. And so come on over, Kirsten. So let's get the books. Okay, so go ahead and you take your part. Go ahead and take part of them. You got it? Yep, yep. yep. Okay, you, okay. So instead of Kirsten doing the books all by herself, I'm helping her. I'm helping her with the heaviness of it. So it's best if we do it together and not all by ourselves. So boys and girls, before you leave, I'm going to read to you a Bible scripture in Hebrews. And it's in chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And it says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So remember, boys and girls, we are stronger together. Our church family is a group of friends who are willing to help us and teach us to learn to follow Jesus. So thank you, boys and girls, for listening to this story, and I hope that you ask for help when you're trying to learn about Jesus from others. We'll see you next time. Bye. This moment is a community, a faith community. I want us to come together in this moment of prayer. As you might see in the news, and you may see many platforms, what is happening right now, what our country is facing at this present moment. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of cries that are being expressed. And for us to just look away, we can. And so at this, I wanna, I wanna invite you and I to kneel. You and I to kneel as a representation of our cry to God. To kneel to say, we don't have the answers, but Lord, we are looking for you for help in this present moment. And so I want to just invite you wherever you're at, if you have a chance to kneel with me, please do so as we call out, as we cry out, as we express this moment and have this moment to talk to our Creator. Let us pray together. God, we come before you today. At this present moment, Lord, and you see and you feel every heart that is hurting. For so many years, Father, we have maybe looked away. For so many years, Father, we maybe never empathize or put ourselves in other people's shoes, God. And Lord, we cry out to you and we say, we're sorry. We're sorry for our brokenness, God. And we're sorry for sometimes feeling that because our life is okay, everybody's life must be okay. And Father, as we come to you, we cry out to you as a community of faith. We cry out to you because we are all broken. We're all hurting. We all need you, God. And as a cry of our people right now, God, there's so many people around the world that at this present moment are right now finding themselves 
on our knees. On our knees surrendering ourselves to you. On our knees reminding ourselves that we are nothing without you. On our knees to express to you that you are everything to us, God. And Lord, forgive us that sometimes we walk through life thinking everything is all right. But Lord, at this moment, God, there's a cry of a people. A cry of a people that are hurting and are crying out for justice. Lord, we know that justice is yours, Lord. And we know that you call us to justice. Allow us to care for each other. Allow us to, to, to empathize and, and to listen to each other. Father, we thank you as well, God, for being a God who listens to our cries. A God who's concerned with our lives. A God who's not just distant, but close to the brokenhearted. And you comfort God. And I pray for those people out there that are, that are sharing, that are protesting, that are coming together, that are feeling that they want their voices to be heard. God, we unify ourselves at this present moment as we kneel together. Lord, remind us who our neighbor is. Remind us that our neighbor is not the person closest to us, but the persons that are around us, the people that we see every day. Lord, help us. Help us present moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. We would like to honor and recognize our graduates this year. We are uh, wishing a happy graduation to Melinda Burton, Carolina Greg of Hazel, Jeremy McClarty, Brianna Wren, Sammy Al-Hakim, Jonathan Hansen, Taco Gavaza, Madison Henderson, Kirsten Lidar, Michael Dossey, Aurora Foster, Kate Machine, Alex Mrachek, Trip Mrachek, Rebecca Roth, Thomas Ashery, and Jenna Wilson. We are so proud of your accomplishments, and we are happy to celebrate this special event with you. Now let's hear from some of them as they will address us. And my name is Kate Machine, and I'm graduating from Loma Linda, and I'm going to go to Loma Linda next year. Hi, my name is Madison Henderson. I am a 12th grade senior who just graduated from Ukaipa High School, and next year I plan on going to the Academy of Arts. Hi, I'm Alexander Maracek, and this year I'll be graduating from 8th grade from Mesa Grande Academy. Next year I will be attending Mesa Grande Academy. My name is Rebecca Roth. I graduated from 8th grade at Redlands Adventist Academy and I plan on going to Redlands Adventist Academy next year. Uh, hi, I'm Jenna and I'm graduating from the 8th grade at RAA and I'll be going into 9th grade next year here at RAA. <laughs> Jack Marachik, also known as Trip. I'm graduating 8th grade from Mesa Grande Academy this year, and I'm going back here again next year for 9th grade because there's no better school on this planet than this one. Hi, my name is Rora and I graduated from Sky Mountain Charter School this year. I'm in 8th grade and I will be going to Sky Mountain Charter School for high school. Hi, it's Carolina. I finish pediatric residency at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. I'll be staying on as chief, followed by Critical Care Fellowship. Thank you to all the love and support of my church family. My name is Thomas Osiri. I'll be graduating from the eighth grade at RAA, and next year I'll be going back to RAA for ninth grade.
We are still in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. The fear, confusion, and uncertainty of the past few months are overshadowed now with the pain, anger, anxiety, increased violence, and unrest of the recent days. We find ourselves in another pandemic, a cultural and spiritual pandemic. We share the hardship, frustration, grief, and sorrow that our African-American brothers and sisters are going through, and our hearts are going out to the families of those who had been unjustly treated and killed. While we are still processing and learning how to be a thoughtful and effective advocates for justice and peace, confronting racism and oppression, the latest development compels us to respond and not be indifferent. And I want to assure you that we commit to using our voices, our actions, our influence against injustice and in support of those who experience it firsthand. I don't claim that I know your pain and understand what you are going through. I recognize that it is your personal journey. But it doesn't take much to recognize that what you are going through is real and it is not right. It is encouraging that so many people actually feel that way and are willing to take a stand for justice. We have been reminded again that prejudice and inequality are still a part of Americans' life. This past week, we quickly learned that one person's actions are not just one person's responsibility. And one person's life taken is not just one person's pain. When we see injustice and abuse of power on a local, regional, state, and national level, it is everybody's pain and an issue of collective responsibility. We've seen enough to recognize that so many lives are impacted by the way others choose to behave. It is the bitter nature of all wrongdoing that we can never keep its consequences to ourselves. Lawlessness only creates more lawlessness. I also cannot ignore those who became innocent victims of unnecessary violence, looting, and destruction, who lost their homes, businesses, life savings, and peace. Lawlessness sometimes comes from a place of hopelessness, but wrong cannot be fixed with wrong. As a humane society, we can do better than that, seeking to be a non-anxious presence in a cultural moment of anxiety and a non-hateful presence in a cultural moment of hatred. Being a source of hope and support for each other as brothers and sisters and children of the same father. The words of the prophet Malachi call us to realize that and come to our senses. Malachi 2.10 says, do not all do not all have one father. Did not one God create us? Why do we deal treacherously, every man, against his brother? Red and yellow, black and white, 
all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. You know, that's a song that I learned, we learned as little children. It's a song that we teach our children. In fact, if I were to sing that song, Brianna would just jump right in because she knows the word of that, words of that song. But in times like these, we are reminded that we are so far from making that a reality. We have so far to go. When we see incidents like what happened to George Floyd happened, we have so far to go. In this past couple of weeks, as I've listened on social media and listened to my friends and even had conversations with our own young people, I realized that just because their skin is dark, they have to live their lives differently. They have to have different conversations with their children because of the color of their skin. One person even told a story about how he was profiled while he was playing basketball at his own church. Or while he was out running, he would be stopped and others would tell how they, 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 they got stopped just because they looked like somebody else. And so sometimes you wonder, you know, incidents like this just keep happening over and over again. Is it worth it to lend my voice to the conversation? Well, let's put it this way. As I watch those images of George Floyd, as I watch that police officer put his, his knee on George Floyd's neck, and George Floyd is yelling, I can't breathe. If that was one of my young people, if that was one of my friends, I would be upset. You couldn't stop me. You couldn't keep me quiet because I care for that person. I care for my young people. I care for my friends. And when I see him being mistreated, there's no questions. Do I lend my voice or not? You see, when I see stuff like this happen, when I see someone else being devalued, especially someone I care about being devalued, I realize it is not right. And I must lend my voice so that it does not happen again. Jesus, uh, scripture says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, that let us make man in our image after our likeness. That's what God says. You and I are created in the likeness of God in, in verse uh, Genesis 1 verse 27, it goes on to say, so God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. There's no distinction. We are all, all created in God's image, no matter what color we are. And when a person chooses to restrain another person by putting the knee on their neck right here, and the person yells out, I can't breathe, and they are already surrounded, they are already cuffed. That person is devaluing that individual. And the thing about it is God values you and I. We are all created in the image of God. And when I choose to ignore the cries of I can't breathe, I'm, it's saying I don't value that person. And when it happens to one of my own, I will lend my voice without question. So the first part of it, as we question, how should we respond to this incident? First, we have to make it personal. What if it was somebody I knew? What if it was my child? I would lend my voice. The second part is this. Sometimes you wonder, what is my post going to do? What is me marching alongside of my brothers and my black brothers and sisters going to do? I mean, after all, don't all lives matter. Give me one second on that. In the past month, there have been four major incidents in which black brothers, about black brothers and sisters have died in police custody for some reason or other, and it's usually mistaken identity. And if we say all lives matter and, black, uh, and, and we say, why do, why do we have to say black lives matter? Because the thing about it is when our black brothers and sisters see these images, it reminds them of other high profile incidents that have already happened. But even at a personal level, they remember the time that they were profiled 
that they were a given mistaken identity or maybe a time they had to deal with some, some issue like that, some issue, unfair issue just because of the color of their skin. And that is a difficult burden to bear. If I must live differently, I must have different conversations with my children because of the color of my skin. That is a heavy burden to bear. You know, the thing about it is with my kids, I must have conversations with them. You must respect authority because that's the right thing to do. Because we follow Jesus, that's why we respect authority. But for our black brothers and sisters, it becomes a matter of life and death. And that is a heavy burden to bear. So when I post on social media, when I listen carefully, when I stand and I walk with my black brothers and sisters and protest of these wrong things that are happening, I am carrying their burdens. In Galatians 6 verse 2, I love this text, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. When I walk alongside my brothers and sisters, when I lend my listening ear and to listen, to understand, not give my opinion, I am helping make their burden light, lighter, not light. It is, I'm carrying that burden. And so when I walk alongside of them, it reminds them that I am not alone. And your presence can do so much wonders. It can give so much encouragement. That's why we are called to stand. And as we stand, as we make the, 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 these stances, because it is the right thing to do, we can begin to experience a taste of the reality of red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. It starts today and it begins with me because all are precious in God's sight. And right now, my black brothers and sisters are hurting and I must stand alongside of them today. So last Friday, for me personally, something happened. You see, on Friday nights, we usually get together on the young adults and we usually talk about topics that are uh, to do with adulting. But something, because of the present situation that's happening, something had to shift. And I said, you know what, God, I, I'm willing to open up. And we literally had a space for young adults to share what they're going through and what they're feeling. And there's one particular thing that just penetrated my heart. You see, as you and I have seen, we've seen so many of the images, whether it's in the news or the different outlets of what's happening currently. Not so much the corona pandemic, but what's happening in the black community. And something really hit me because I said a question. I said, how are you feeling at this present moment? And as we talked about justice and we looked at justice from the biblical point, we started, it's been really just powerful to see what the word justice really conveys in the scriptures. It was pretty much saying, how much do you care? How much do you care, Jonathan, about these people? And it's been really pressing on my heart because after the conversation was over, this person called and called me back and crying, this young adult crying, knowing that she has a two-year-old son crying, said to me this. She said, I don't know if I haven't been able to sleep this last couple of days. The reality has been that I felt like George Floyd, as my son grows up, can be that person. And can be that person that literally this police brutality is able to just capture him and he might be the next victim that this happens to. And this is a mother crying, can't sleep, thinking about this. And it got me thinking, just because now in this present moment, as you know, I'm a father, to see my son being racially discriminated for the color of their skin or their height or the way they look. And it's got me challenging because for a couple moments, I've been looking at the story of the Good Samaritan. And I wanted to share this because it's been really challenging me. You guys all know the story. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 36. If you want to take a good look, go ahead. Luke chapter 10 
And this is what it says. See, there's this conversation and interaction between this religious expert leader and Jesus. And he says, what do I have to do to eternal life? And he says, well, you have to love the Lord with all your God, with all your mind and all your soul. And we're like, that's, that's it. But love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he tried to justify his actually, who is my neighbor? And it's interesting because I've asked myself, who is my neighbor? Maybe you're asking yourself, who is your neighbor? Or maybe you're saying, my neighbor is just the person across from me or the person from me. But as challenging as it is, Jesus here uses the analogy or the story of a Samaritan as his neighbor. You see, Jews and Samaritans disliked each other. And yet Jesus brings up a Samaritan person that... We see the story say that the priest looked away, the Levite looked away, but the Samaritan looked into this person hurting heart, and he didn't just look, but he went to help. You see, I just want to challenge us in this season to lean into listening, to lean into listening to the people that feel that they haven't been, that we haven't been maybe listening to them for so long to lean into listening and understanding what is the pain and hurt that they're going through? What is it from their point of view? What is it, who is my neighbor? How can I love my neighbor? I think the best way that we can love is when we lean into listening. And so my challenge to you, church, is that in times like these, I've been able to reach out to some of my friends to see how they're doing from the black community, to see how we can do. And the Bible also challenges in Proverbs 31, 8 and 9, it says this, stand up and speak up. See, if there's something we can do is to stand up, to speak up, but we can't stand or speak if we don't understand the pain that these people have been enduring for so many years. And so my challenge to us my challenge to each one of us as Christians is to really look deep down inside and if we really want to live out this gospel, to ask ourselves, who is my neighbor? And to love not just the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our mind, and with all our souls, but to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. The Bible tells us we all came from one couple, and science agrees that we are all, all one race. Acts 17, 26 says, from one man he made every nation of men to inhabit the whole earth. God created one human race that has different expressions of his beauty and creativity. The next verse reveals God's intentions and purpose. Verse 27 says, God intended that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. We are called to love all men and women, for God's intention is for all to be saved. When we know our values, in the eyes of God, we can love and appreciate others. There are no inferior people groups in God's eyes. When people become careless about godly values, they will be found careless about other social and moral matters of life and have no regards for the sanctity of human life. It is a universal truth that the wrong against men is the wrong against God. To sin against our fellow creatures is to sin against God himself. We are all children of the same Father, and therefore we should be fair in our dealings with one another. We should love one another and cooperate with one another for our mutual advantage in all that is virtuous and noble. Pain and evil surround us. In the moment, pain can seem louder than reason. It can string, scream above the voice of God. It can pursue means that yield destruction. It can temporarily place band-aids on broken bones. It can move swiftly to deal with fruit without examining the roots. Disappointment, hopelessness, or even despair can lead to self-effort and self-reliance, drowning the reliance and trust in God. If we are not careful to guard our hearts, we can become reactionary rather than instruments of radical change. There are opportunities in adversity 
to rise to the occasion as an ambassador of positive change or to be trapped by evil. An eye for an eye eventually makes the whole world blind. I firmly believe God hears, he sees, he cares. God is not screaming over the chaos. He is extending a hand, a whisper, an invitation to draw near. He understands more than anyone the pains humanity bears. His own son was murdered without justice, just cause, persecuted, betrayed, and abandoned. Jesus was an innocent man, brutalized and hung on the cross. God knows the deepest depths of human suffering. He weeps. God comes overflowing with compassion. God comes to heal the deep places inside that continue to bleed. He bottles the tears no one else can see. It requires courage and dignity not to stoop to the level of those who have violently opposed us. It requires humility to yield to God and forgive even when people are not repentant nor remorseful. Forgiveness is not condoning evil. It is preventing evil from consuming our own soul. It is re releasing a guilty person to God. Faith in God involves strong belief that the greatest justice is led from heaven's throne. God isn't distant or out of touch. He's not like us. He's more engaged than people can imagine. To those of you who feel marginalized or vulnerable, you are loved by God. Hold your heads high in dignity, knowing that you, we, are created in the image of God. Choose to yield to a kingdom that is higher, a king far greater, and to abide in the one who is true love. To rise above evil requires dignity, courage, and strong sense of identity. To listen to God and move in his ways of justice requires surrender to God and humility. As children of God, we fight with different weapons. We choose a higher way. We choose light over darkness, good over evil, and godly justice over ungodly paths of revenge. Let no man bring you so low as to hate him or to return evil for his evil. For darkness is never extinguished by darkness. It can only be expelled by light. May we abide in the light of God and shine. It is easy to turn, to turn a blind eye to things not personally impacted us or our community. Yet, I do not believe that that is the way of Christ. I truly believe this can be the church's finest hour. We can rise in love, dignity, and defeat injustice God's way. We can demonstrate to the world who God is. The two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. If I treat my neighbor unjustly, the root of the matter must be within me. And if I don't love myself, the solution can be found in loving God because he is love and the source of love. While the protests are important, and can draw attention to a necessary change. The real change does not happen on the streets. The real change takes place in converted hearts when we see each other as children of the Heavenly Father created in His image with liberty and justice for all. It starts with the change of a personal heart, followed by the change of the family, change of the community, and the rest of the world around us. We can't be indifferent to the events that are happening around us right now. We need to exercise all possible means to stand for what is right. However, we need to be realistic. The change that human efforts might bring are often partial, temporary, limited, and artificial. The real change comes with the kingdom of God. When his will is established on earth, as it is 
in heaven. He alone can restore the order and human life. We are looking forward to the day when Jesus comes to make things right. Until then, I pray that the actions of some will not cause others to generalize or ignore them because it does not directly affect them. I pray that love will prevail in our hearts and in the hearts of others. And our, out of kindness, we will accept our differences as an acknowledgement that we are the children of one Father created in his image. Look at Jesus. Stay connected to Jesus. Give yourself and others lots of love, compassion, mercy, and grace. Life is challenging enough. No more bodies on the ground. No more cities burned. Love like Jesus. Live like Jesus lived. Act like Jesus acted. Let's sing our closing hymn, number 529, Under His Wings. And we will sing verses 1 and 2. Forgive us for the sins of insecurity, pride, and racism. You created one race, human. You love every single person on this planet. Help us to view others from your perspective. Help us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Heal the wounds of those who are suffering from any form of oppression and injustice. Guide the minds of those who are in the position of authority to ensure fair treatment. Eradicate the plagues of the deep roots of fear, pride, insecurity, and injustice in our country and in the world. Please forgive us and bring the real change into our hearts and into our lives, in, into this world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.